Good evening, everybody. How you doing? How you doing? I am Carvel Bailey back one more time, one more time on life and basketball. So I'm going to give Facebook a little time to load up to invite people to the show because like every week we have a star studded guest that's teaching you about everything that we're doing, life and basketball. But I want to tell you right now, I told you last week, sent out invites, share this information. Last week when Coach Tree was on, he blazed y'all with great information. I came back this week all right, with another Chicago legend. So you definitely want to share this information, share this Facebook Live, invite whoever you want, because this is not only going to be some more history, but it's going to also be educational, which is what we do. So send those invites out. Give us some likes. Give us some hearts. I'm I, I'm sending invites out myself, but I want to kind of get into it. This is Life and Basketball. I am your host, Carvel Bailey. And what this show is intended to do is it's intended to bridge and bring together both life as well as basketball. Because with basketball, you learn about life and you learn about life's lessons and, you know, just different things to help you get better in life. But once you understand life on a different level, then it helps also with things like basketball and other sports. But we're here, obviously, life and basketball. You can learn from all sports, but we're talking about basketball specifically here. And so that's what we do, you know, with this show, bring things on. We talk about real life basketball situations and how that affected or can affect, you know, life or the course of, of, of life, whoever is involved in those things. So, you know, we keep it positive. We keep it upbeat. Um, but we are here again from the Blessed Ball Studios in Chicago land, Illinois. And this show is being sponsored by Blessed Ball Skill Development Academy. Bless the Ball Skill Development Academy is a year-round skill development academy where we enrich and teach um, and educate others both physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, psychologically, as well as spiritually on the things that they need development on. And we use the vehicle of basketball. So that's what we do at Bless the Ball. We have camps. We have clinics. Um, we are a Chicago Public Schools vendor, and we work with other schools also. So we do after-school programs, uh, character character uh, uh, development programs, and the whole nine, um, public speaking, mentoring, and everything. And also the show is being sponsored by, again, one of my most precious creations thus far, which is my book, Understanding Life Through the Game of Basketball. All right, this is a great book. It's not going to teach you how to shoot a jump shot. It's not going to tell you what type of presses or offense to run. This book is designed for anyone that's in a leadership role, anyone in a coach's role, be it if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a pastor, if you're a coach, administrator, any type of, of, of leader or coach. This book is here to help you and just give you some different strategies and some understanding of, one, what goes into the thought process of other leaders, but also what goes into the thought process of college coaches or college head coaches. You know, I, I speak about some of the things that I had to do and learn from leadership. I speak about John Wooden, uh, Dean Smith. So it's a great book, 1999. Go pick it up. I will drop the links in the Facebook Live. But with that being said, I don't want to take up too much more time. All right. As I said, we have a Chicago Lamb basketball legend that's allowing for us to visit today that's coming on our show. Pardon me, Bill, don't worry about that. Um, this guy, none other, all right, a friend of mine, great coach, excellent, a, 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 a better person, all right, than he is a coach and he's a hell of a coach. All right? His record speaks for itself, but that speaks about the individual that he is. But without further ado, I want to bring in my brother, Tracy Dildy, coach, how you doing today, man? Man, I'm blessed, my brother. I'm just so thankful, man, and just so proud of the job you are doing and all that, you know, facets that you just continue to just show and how you continue to reinvent yourself, man, with 
all areas that need it. And so, man, just, you know, with just what you do with your workout and just that whole, man, bless the ball. You, you know, you're a true living example of that. Just, you know, just from your playing career and the lives you have touched through basketball. And so, man, it's just a blessing. Um, you know, people say legend and people say good coach and they say good person. But first and foremost, man, I'm a man of God and I'm an unapologetic uh, Christian. And so, uh, you know, strong faith and and my joy come from the Lord. So, man, I'm um, just blessed. Any opportunity I could, you know, just get on the line and I could share some of the things, you know, I know or some of the things I believe. It's always a blessing. And then yes, when you get... So you, you you never in the game of basketball, you never stop learning. And right. you know, man, I'm born Chicagoan. I'm a Chicago through and through. Um, you know, had a great career growing up. I uh, had some men in my life, man, that had really uh were great examples to me. And one was the one you just had on the show last week in Tree. And so uh, you know, I've just blessed, man, that I've had uh didn't have a father in the house, but I had so many other men around from my neighborhood and my community that helped just kind of shape my life and taught me some things that um, maybe my mother being a single parent wouldn't have been able to teach. So it, it has been, and it had a lot to do with just that, the ball basketball. And so that is really man, a true statement when you talk about bless the ball. Um, and, and that describes my life. Yeah. Okay, well, um, you know, you are modest, uh, and I can definitely, I can definitely appreciate that. But let's just kind of get into it, you know. And I don't know if you was reading my mind or not, but the last thing that you just said was you talked about your neighborhood, and I know if it's, if it's, I would say two things, but it's three things now because you're a grandfather. Congratulations on that. I want to publicly say that so I know that, you know, those kids yeah. kind of got you wrapped around their finger, you know. <laughs> but um, um yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. but I know that it's it's two things that means a lot to you. Um, and one is your particular program, you know, in Chicago State. I know that means a lot to you. And I know that your neighborhood means a lot to you because anybody that knows you at some point in time will hear and understand that you're from Parkside. So can you explain a little bit about how that shaped you? What was going on with just the, you know, the game banging the drugs? I hear that in, um, but like, like I said, man, in my life that kept me away from me from those things. Um, that neighbor, my neighborhood, you know, getting a lot of neighborhood. But because of bad talk, of some of the guys that was in my life, the older guys, man, they kept me on a straight and narrow line. They wouldn't let me hang out as supposed to be. And man, I think all the way up until I was you know, almost seven, they would make me go home when the street lights came on and all, all those things that I thought was cruel back then I'm just so thankful people that cared about me mm -hmm. actually from the same bloodline but just really killed something in me that they went astray and I love, love my neighborhood community I am a product of my community right every day Indian nightly for my and as much as I back to my community and try to give back. Um, yeah, no, that's that's I mean, you said a lot in that just in that comment, coach. Um, and I was hearing you and understanding you. I'm not sure I'm checking my service, I'm not sure if it's yours going in and out, but I think that we heard you. But now what I took from everything that you said was that. No matter, no matter the circumstances or the things that went on inside of the hood or, or you know, different people situations, it was still standards 
because you had to go to school. Like you were the shorty. You know, you you couldn't get in trouble. So as in life, the same way if it's on a basketball team, you know, in, in, in life, you know, I'm 42. So obviously I'm younger than you I always say that I'm the last of the old school generation. Yeah. But yeah. It was like rules and standards. And it was really no gray area. You know, you you kind of did what you were told as opposed to now. A lot of times the kids do what they see and not what they're told. When, when, when we came up, it was kind of do as we told and, 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 and not as we see, you know, so you you one had to deal with the standards of that neighborhood. But then you were also held accountable but if you didn't do it or not, so can you talk about like just 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 that uh, uh, accountability portion and like how that, you know, without going all into it, but how that accountability portion, oh man, I better be in school. They go, you know, the guys, they're going to get on me if I ain't where I'm supposed to be. Like, how did that help you as you've progressed in your life, not only your career, just being accountable? Great word example because. You know, my man, I had an uh, older brother who really, knew they were doing the right thing. And so they were a great example. But what really got my attention was when the guys that I would see do go to school and the ones that uh, was drink smoking was the ones that told me they better not catch me over there doing what they were so is Straight in line, I was a part of that journey. Right. Not what it is you see. So, that, man. And um, the love and the concern that they had for me, saw in me, this pitch you to do something bigger and better. For my neighborhood, you know, I love my neighborhood, and I and I thought we had the best basketball players, the best mm-hmm. uh, game bangers. So, so I would argue, <laughs> and uh, it just really laid on in life as you know, back on those things. You get to say, man, if he would have done, what up would I? And so I'm so thankful to guys that guys is still still in jail, and guys getting out of jail, and you know, get rest in peace, and they all had a hand on shaping me. Said, right. I was the person where it took a village, and I was one of the um, the ones that were saved through the village. Okay, now um, give us some of the good, some of the great basketball players that you can name, and I know you probably got a lot of them, but give us a few basketball players that came out of Parkside Coaches. I know you're saying a lot of great players came out of there. Share some names with us so that people can just kind of get an understanding of, you know, your neighborhood. Like last week, Coach Trey and I talked about the great basketball players on the south side, the great players on the west side, kind of what the difference is in the two. You know, but Tree made a powerful statement. If they working together, they can be unstoppable. And we'll get to that in a minute because I know that you played alongside, you know, some guys from the West Side and different neighborhoods, and y'all were unstoppable. <laughs> but give us some guys that came from Parkside. Well, you know, man, I got to start with my old was no longer here. Uh, one of the best players that ever come out community, guys like like Cardale. Who, who name was Minnesota? He actually went on in basketball at the University of Minnesota. Gilbert Thompson, who played it out. The guy Lou Coleman is a guy that's around the city now, who actually is working guys out. And I'm sure you know Lewis Coleman, but Lou yeah. Coleman, his brother Martin Coleman, was a guy that had a trial with the San Antonio Spurs. Um, you know, so, so the list goes on and on, man. You talk about Donnie Kersey who's a good mm-hmm. high school coach right now. He's from my neighborhood. He had a younger brother named Brian Kirksey. Okay. Also from my neighborhood. And then when you talk about uh, one of the young up-and-coming coaches who's over at University of Illinois right now, 
Ron Coleman that we call Chin. He's from right. my neighborhood. Okay. Now, Vera okay. Lusa, uh, from my neighborhood. Uh, Emmanuel Dildy, my nephew, who's the assistant coach at Valpo, you know, neighborhood. Uh, really good player in the name of uh, Eugene Morgan, who started at CVS and went on to play out in Alaska Anchorage. And so, man, the list goes on and on of the guys. And, and I don't like to start naming because you end up – Leaving somebody out. And, 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 and probably the best player from my neighborhood, man, this guy probably was by the name of Harold Poston, who mm. never played college basketball. Okay. Phenomenal. And he was one of the guys that would go on the court, and if it was going to 32, he'd probably score 20. And then right, right. after the game, he'd go right over there and get him a 40 out. <laughs> but he was probably the best player to come out of our neighborhood. Man. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and so it, it's those type of stories and it's those type of um, basketball players that were my role models and who right. I looked right. up to. Right. And, and so, you know, we, so we had, and, and we would go and play against different neighborhoods. We would go play against O'Keefe. We would go play against Grandma. We would go over on the west side and play against Douglas Park. Mm -hmm. We would go play, and, and, and it was a community. It was our neighborhood versus other neighborhoods. Right. So right. Fighting other game maker neighborhoods, we were playing against those neighborhood athletes, and so right, um, yeah. So it, 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 man, it just was it was a great time growing up, and I'm just so in, in, indebted, and I'm just so thankful right. that those people saw something in me that they kept me on the straight and narrow. Right. Well, um, you know, so now I want to talk about. You know, after you get out of grammar school, go into high school. But one thing that you said, Coach, was, you know, everybody, even though one gangbang neighborhood, another gangbang neighborhood, y'all were able to go in those neighborhoods because it was it was kind of a kind of a code of the streets about athletes and not being involved or kind of being hands off. Am I correct or not? That's, yes. And. and and that was the great thing about it. You could go into neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood because athletes was like you say, it was a code and it was a street code when the athletes, they were protected. And, and, and so, you know, man, and that's something that has really disappointed me in just over the last, you know, five to 10 years. Yeah. Because it was a yeah. time when the athletes was off limits. Right. And, you know, and, and it was rules and it was, you know. Yeah. Etiquette to the even to you know the street stuff to the streets so, it's, it's, exactly. And so now you know just to see that just you know it's no you know it, it's just no codes or nothing. There's no rules at all now. Right. And it was rules, man. Where you you know you didn't cuss in front of elders. Elders, exactly. You, you know, man. Certain things you didn't do in front of the church, and just to see all those things and all those past rituals just. Go it's away. thrown away, right? Yeah. And so. you, you know, and and that's that's why I kind of do what I do. You know, I mean, again, that's that's why kind of the book. You know, like I do, and you talked about, you know, the guy that would score twenty out of the thirty-two, but then he'd go and you know get a forty. <laughs> well, what 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 basketball players, well, athletes, but basketball players in particular. What they don't understand, and us as coaches always try to get them to understand, you know, one, we are teaching you about life, but you have to be committed and dedicated to the choices that you make. You know, if, if, if you know, and I'm saying that kind of twofold because you know, you know, you've been playing and coaching, you know, you may get that one every now and then that teeter totters that want to be a basketball player want to be in the streets. You know what I'm saying? And and they teeter-tottering, and you want them to understand that, you know, you have to be dedicated and committed to the choice that you make. You know, if, 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 if you want to be out there, then you have to understand what goes on out there and yeah. make that choice. You know what I'm saying? But if, if you want to be in this gym, and if you want to learn, you know, from somebody that really has your best interest in mind, yeah. then you have to make that choice too. You know, and I think that you know, our kids nowadays have a hard time making choices. And I think part of that is because it's easier for them to make, say, a negative choice because those are really the people that's 
kind of, you know, open hands welcoming them in. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I, I totally understand everything you've said. And it's like you're saying, and that's what life is about, is choices. And, and, and we have those choices. And, and like you said, all this other stuff looks glamorous. Right. But you're really taking a chance. Yeah. And one of the things I tell our players on a daily basis, you know, because I let them know I love them constantly. Exactly. I also tell them when we leaving each other that uh, just a split decision that you make can get you in some trouble that it takes the rest of your life to get you out of. Yes, sir. So I want them to always walk with that, that, man, this decision, it could, it, it takes me a second to get into it, but it could take me years and possibly my life to get out of it. And so that's one of the things that um, I tell you, and just as you see in a community, man, um, you, you, you know, it, it, it looks good. And, you know, you see the people with the fancy clothes, the fancy cars. And so that looks entertaining versus going in this hot gym. It's no air conditioning. <laughs> and the ball, and the, the floor is dusty. So, so that choice. Right. Right. So now, now I, I'm going I'm to stick to what I'm talking about. But, you know, but we... You, you know, having a conversation. And so you lead me now because we, uh, I was, I'm not sure if it was Sean Pryor, one of your former um, uh, assistant coaches, or if it was somebody else, but we were talking about kids nowadays. I, I like to call them air conditioned generation. Like they don't, under, they, they, they've never been on the, on the blacktop, you know, and having to play when it's hot and, you know, you got to go to the water fountain every now and then, or even here with us, you know, again, I'm 42, but when it snows, sometimes we had our shovel out, you know, so, but and, kids now playing perfect conditions, and I didn't think about this until the year that the San Antonio Spurs played the the Heat in the finals, and the game when, when uh, James, you know, kept getting them Charlie horses, because they were in San Antonio, and I think the air went out, mm -hmm. and it was brutal. Well, you know, like, I know, because I was telling my, my wife, I said, first of all, Boston Celtics cut the air off on, uh, on you know, the lake. <laughs> I said, like, like certain things are home court advantage. I've been in gyms as players, as a player and coach, where you go in in the winter and it's totally freezing. But 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 you know that team has practiced like that on a regular. So they throwing you out of your elements. Or well, I've come in a gym. One of the hottest gyms I've ever been in was Du Sable because they got the radiators on the wall and, you know, the benches up, up against the wall. But. I, you know, I was saying that about, you know, the air conditioned generation because it was hot in that gym. And so he kept getting Charlie horses, you know, and I said, like, I question and wonder as his generation or particularly LeBron James, has he ever played in those type of conditions to where his body, you know, what I'm saying he really didn't know how to take care of his body like that. And I think those things now as us older generation look at basketball we call the game you know softer you know a little bit more watered down than when we play because it's that deal with at, at adverse situations you know yeah. and, and, and just and you hit it right on the head there because you gotta look at it now if you tell like even my son who's now 32 years old <laughs> when i would tell him and you know you tell i tell our players about true stories and we right. actually go shovel snow to go play. When they look at us like that's a fairy tale and some stuff we're making up, we would go out and play all day right. in the playground. Right. Looking like, how did you do that? Was it? So, so, so those look like fairy tales. Yeah. We would play on the court where one rim is higher than the other. Yes. On the full court. And, and, and they look at you now like, what? Mm -hmm. And they look at you like, man, y'all hit bad. Yeah. Well, been in the Stone Ages and, but I'm telling you, those are the things that made us, uh, and, and I like to just kind of always say how, you know, I felt I was a tough basketball player. And I think right. playing in those conditions, they really toughened us. Yeah, and, yes. You know, the new generation now, I don't want to call them soft, but I tell you, they are clearly not as tough. And I have this discussion all the time with, and I'm a LeBron fan. I love all the things he does off the court. Right. I love it. Basketball player, but I tell people, hey, he could have never played in that old NBA. 
Mm, exactly. And I was looking at some of the fouls that was there was just fouls. Well, yeah. now those fouls get you a fine, get you suspended for games. And, <laughs> yeah. And so, but but, it, but but I wouldn't have traded it for the world. I do feel sorry for these new generations because they didn't get a chance to experience that. Exactly. And I think that's hurting basketball, I will say, in this country mm-hmm. that we just don't have. And that's why I feel other countries have kind of caught up with us. There you go. Because we just don't have uh, what I would call that killer instinct mm-hmm. that we used to have on the right. court. Right. And I would tell the stories about even in the playground, pickup, where it might be 70 guys out there. So right. you had to win because if you didn't win, you were sitting. Street lights would be coming on, and you probably not get back on the court. Right. Like, we just don't have that. And, you know, like like AAU, you know, you're going to play five or six games regardless. Win or lose, exactly. you still play five or six games. It don't and matter. Has, I think has had a toll on us as far as that killer instinct and that just, you know, really wanting to win. Yes, sir. And it made, and it made us into who we are. Right. And it, and it, and it made us – probably more mentally stronger than it is physically. You know, I asked um, um, Brian Notry, to, you know, the other day, and we were talking about him. He was a guest on the show, but he was just saying how, like, he's not a kid in the – was not a coach in the country that won't take a Chicago kid. And, you know, I mean, you've coached all around the country, and, you know, I mean, you've been able to come back home and, you know, get those players, but – I think the mental toughness more than anything out of all of those conditions has helped us. But speaking about mental toughness, coach, we know that you went to Martin Luther King high school. Um, I'm not going to ask you like year by year, but how were you all able to be so good at King? Well, I can say one one thing for sure was, uh, and I like to, you know, um, I had the opportunity to be one of the first players ever to start varsity as a freshman. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, the trend that everybody's doing now, I kind of was a part of starting that trend. Right. I started on a varsity team, and not just a, but one of the top varsity teams. Right. Out of my four years there, we was ranked number one team in the nation on two occasions. Mm-hmm. And... You know, a lot of has to do with, man, we had a coach that don't get as much credit as he should, but he still was one of the best coaches that I've ever played for. And not only was he, what made him even better was that he was also a father figure. Mm. And what people didn't get to see about Coach Cox was the love he had for all his basketball players. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, the man would go way beyond the call of duty and was always there when one of his, you know, student athletes needed him. Right. Always. Right. And he was one of the guys, if you didn't go to class, he had a paddle and he also <laughs> wore a ring. Right. So if he caught you missing a class or a teacher said you wasn't in class. Exactly. Well, he was going to wear you out. Right. A paddle or this. And so, you know, he, 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 he put that fear in you. Right. And also he allowed the freedom in you to get better and explore and mm-hmm. to enjoy and have fun with the game. Mm-hmm. Coach mm-hmm. is the most underrated coach this city have ever seen. Most mm-hmm. underrated. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. See, and I mean, if you say he's, he's most underrated and I look at him like, you know I mean? A lot of people know who he is, but, um, you know, listening to you, it sounds like, you know, you may can't say it, but I can say it. It sounds like what you're saying, anything other than one, he underrated, you know, because he 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 was was that kind of guy. And I think when you talk about the tough love, you know, not only, you know, now now we're talking and and you know, I was actually explaining it a couple shows ago that it was, you know, because Note Note was talking about Bob Hambrick, and I'm like, you know, you have some of some of these older coaches that has always understood that life, you know, basketball is, you know, or life is bigger than basketball. So they tried to raise you as a straight up 
strong young man and yes. they were using basketball as that vehicle. So I'm just kind of picking up the torch and, you know, going going with it on the, based on the things that I was taught. But if yeah, he's yeah. going to wear you out, you know, you know, I you know, when I used to go in parents house, I used to always tell their parent, listen, I'm not going. You know, I'm going to hug your son when he need a hug. I'm going to kick your son when he need a kick. But I'm not going to hug your son when he needs a kick, and I'm not going to kick your son when he needs a hug. Yeah. So, so you know, what you were saying about Coach Cox, what, what y'all probably didn't understand at that time was y'all was a representation of him, too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. if, if you know, if, if, if y'all didn't act accordingly in class, well, now that's making him look bad. You know, and especially if you yeah. all are are – was of the level that you are, yeah. Even though if you know you you have people that that like success, but then you have a lot of people, and it's just human. You have a lot of people that resent people for the success they had. So just as many people at King that was probably cheering you guys on, I'm probably sure it was a, a group of people that was waiting on y'all to mess up so y'all can get knocked off that pedestal. Yeah, and, and, and you gotta look at in. In four years as a starter on varsity, I lost a total of eight games in four years. Mm. You know, that, that, that's winning. And the other thing with Coach, man, like I, I, I said, Coach' biggest thing was now he also, which I said, was the best, and I wish I could get back to that. Every day in the summer, we were with him. Okay. He would pick us up. This is in the summertime. Right. He would pick us up at nine in the morning on. I'm talking about every day when we out of school, every day on at nine o'clock in the morning, and you was with and he'd drop you back off at home probably at nine o'clock that night. Mm-hmm. We would practice. We would be playing in two or three different tournaments. Right. But you was with him every day. And that's what people don't realize too when you talk about kind of the old school coaches. Now, he was married and he had you know, he had a daughter. But he was with us, right? More than he was at home. Mm. Now that imagine that sacrifice there. That sacrifice right. alone says it all. Yes, and that's what you know. It, it, it says it alone. And you wanted to play for Cox because what he's going to do, he was going to give you a lot of freedom, right, on the court, within the team structure. Exactly. You going to go off and be on your own. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're going to get it. Remember, he played with two seven footers in right. high school. Yeah, and they both were exactly, and, you know, that, and they both was happy. And, yeah, you know, man, you know, I tell you about it. That was um, and, and one of the things that stick with me right today that he used to say, um, I was his point guard, and then as a freshman, he babied me. But as I got older, now I became like his whipping boy. Yeah, and the one thing he said to me that stuck with me is, "Hey." If I'm getting on you, that means I see something in you. Exactly. Now, you don't want not to get on you because that means I don't see nothing in you. Exactly. And that have stuck with in life. Yep. And I share that with my players now. If I'm getting on you, I'm constantly calling your name, it's because I, I see something in you. I know that you, you don't see. I yep. Know yeah. And so yep. that has stuck with me. And I use that right today. Okay. Yeah, no, and that's, you know, even with students, I try to get students to understand, and, you know, with my players as well, um, you know, and I actually first learned it, you know, from my mom. She was like, you know, when I stopped talking, that's when you get word, and I'm like, you know, and she might have been talking about doing the dishes or something, you know, okay, hey, you know, so, yeah, that that has been, you know, a pillar of kind of, you know, who I am also. And so now, you know, we talk about King, you know, the great success that y'all had at King. You played with some great players throughout your high school career, uh, both on your team and in the summertime or, or different things like that. Yeah. Can, can, can you share the story? Because you shared it with me one night about, um, about Tim Hardaway. You were saying, like, y'all was on y'all way to a party or something. Can you explain that story, please? And, 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 and let me tell you, and I got to take a like, and I, I share that story with our players too, right today. And this was, man, we, we talking about this was in 83. This was the summer. I, actually, this was the summer of 84. And me, 
another guy that was a legend who played at High Park. His name was Gerald Haywood. Okay. Me and Gerald Haywood, actually, now both of us ranked higher than Tim Hardaway when we was in high school. Right. And earlier that day, we had just played pick up, we played basketball outside pickup. Me, Gerald, Tim, and all of us. And so we left. Me and Gerald went home to shower because it was going to be, it was a party at Bindu that night. Okay. And back in the day, Bindu's had the best Jump parties. And yeah. We went home, we got changed, we got dressed, and we got back together, me and Gerald, and we were on our way to the party, and we were driving past the playground that we had played in earlier, and the lights are on, but it's dark, and all you do is hear a ball. And so me and Gerald is wondering, like, who was out there? Right. Well, you know, that way it's about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Me and Gerald laughing and teasing Tim because he he out there on the court playing ball. Right. His game. And me and Gerald laughing at him and this and that. And we go to the party. Well, 78 years later, when Tim Hardaway, the one who makes it to the NBA, right. to have a long, great NBA career, yeah. And going to end up being an NBA Hall of Famer. Hall of Famer, yeah. I tell that story to all our players. While we was laughing and joking and teasing him, when he was on the court, and in the end, it all paid off. And one thing we know about basketball, whatever you put in it, you're going to get out. You hey, can't cheat if, the game. You can't. You can't cheat. And when you go, that story – yeah, and you know, and you know, I always say if you do the work, the results will come. You know, but not what that story said to me was, you know, like a couple of things. You got to be dedicated, but also you have to be wired a different way to really not mind or not really care of about the what's what other people are doing and what pressure. other people thinking right you know the peer pressure the peer you know pressure, because yeah. you, you you have to be laser focused and you know you know as you said tim was might have not have been ranked as high as y'all but he was working because he understood that yeah. it, you know that he was trying to do something um special you know which you know he he, he definitely did great player you know people yeah, don't yeah. Understand, run TMC. You know, I tell all these new kids, they just not getting on Golden State Warriors. They don't understand the Warriors used to be fun to watch when they had them dudes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. But now, so, and, and that's it. Sure. Now, you know, we so you know now we we tell the Tim story, and so the, and I, I'm I'm actually about this because you know when I did a quick advertisement about you being on the show, I actually took one of your pictures from the Boston shootout. And it's a picture in there. I know you, Lowell Hamilton, you know, a whole lot of other guys. Can you kind of explain what the Boston shootout was and why that was so special? You know, because it's, you know, I know when I came up, you know, myself and John L., you know, even, you know, Kenny Williams and, you know, all those guys, it was like the Prairie State game. It wasn't really AU. But can you talk about the Boston shootout? I was one of the best. Thing that, and uh, Ruben Norris was the guy who coached us. Oh. A, you know, a, a great referee. Right. And what the cities would do, your major cities, they would get the best players from each city, and we would meet in Boston, and they mm. would have a tournament. And so you had Chicago, you had L.A., you had Houston, you had uh, Chicago, L.A., Houston, Atlanta, you had Boston, and you had New York. And you had man, so all the top teams, and we all meet it in in Boston. Okay, and then it, it was a big tournament, and, and so it was just a great experience. It wasn't AU basketball; it was hey, you know, we, these is the best that we selected from right, the top right, of the area. right. And we one team, and we would go and play against the other team, and that's what the other cities did too, man. And which it was great. You went to Boston. Uh, Boston did a great job in sponsoring the event every year, and um, it, it was fun. And our team was special. We had Tim, me, Tim Hardaway, Lowell Hamilton, Gerald Haywood, mm. uh, my assistant coach James Farr, okay, Melvin McCants, 
remember, Melvin McCann's and James Farr had just won the state championship that year. Right. Mark Carmel. Right. And then we had big uh yeah, Jerry, Jerry Jones. Man, we had a great team. Tony mm. King. And, okay. and it was guys from the South Side, the West Side, the Catholic League, the Public League, the Suburban. And it was just, man, it was a great um event. Anthony Emmanuel, who was another really good guard at that time, was supposed to be on the team. But during that weekend, he had a visit to Georgetown. Mm. So, uh, yeah, but that was a – man, it, it was a great team assembled. And we ended up losing to a New York team. Okay. Who was coached by Nate Archibald. Mm. And the same team was the team that lost to Michigan in the championship when Michigan and Seton Hall played in the championship. Oh. The green kids. And, there was a, a bunch of them kids on that same team. Okay. 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 To beat us. Uh, wow. Yeah. In, in, in yeah, in eighty five, eighty five, nineteen eighty five, um, and so you know, so after that, you know, you take your talents to San Diego, um, you know, then you 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 come back home to UIC and play. What was one of the biggest um, learning curves or things that you had to learn? I mean, from Chicago to San Diego, still kind of big city, big city. But just from high school, even though you were a star-studded athlete, like in terms of college as and basketball, because when you're in college now, the pace is faster. You know, you got to think quicker. You got more responsibilities. But what was the kind of the the most challenging thing going from high school to college and being, you know, out in San Diego? The, the, I'm saying the most challenging to me that um, the fact that I was away from home. Uh, I had played high school ball in grade school, and basically every game I'd ever played, my mother was there, my mm. sisters was there, you know, other relatives was at the game. And so then now to go out west to San Diego, which is a beautiful city, a great university, I had fun there. It's just really homesickness settled in. Okay. Um, and not looking at the fans and seeing those familiar faces. It really, it, you know, it was tough. And, and so, you know, I, I came home. The thing that when I was coming out, and which is the same thing, I think a lot of student athletes, a lot of basketball players and football players, when they come, the first thing they get to thinking in their mind is, hey, I want to get away. I want to get away. Right. Well, as I got older, I realized really what I was saying was, hey, I just want to get out of my mother's house. Exactly. And so then, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And so, yeah. Uh, when I was able to transfer back to UIC, I was living in the dorm, and then I headed back where um, my mother and my sisters and my relatives was all coming back to the games at the Pavilion. So right. really what I was saying, and I tell guys in recruit today is, you know, when you say, hey, I want to get away, what you really said, I just want to get out of my folks' house. Right. So if I go to a place where they got the dorms and I ain't got to be living in my, and I got my, you know, that's really what I'm saying. Right. I ain't really saying I just want to get out of the city. They said, right. I just want to get out of my people house. Right. So I tried to explain. I was a victim of that. Right. And then I came back, and it was just like my high school days, man, just seeing the familiar faces and yeah. the people cheering for you, you know, really pulling for you and really love you. And so it was just, man, tough just being away from home after being used to so much love from home. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's big because – you know, we all know the homesickness is real, you know, especially when we know as people that genuinely care about us, you know, but I yeah. think that, that, that uh, you know, a lot of times, and I didn't have the luxury, you know, when I was at Truman or Malcolm X because we didn't necessarily have the housing, but I understood that same thing. Like, you may just want to change your environment and your environment may be getting off your block and, you know, being someplace else. So if we can put you in some proper housing, if we had it away from that environment, or especially with dorms, you know, now you you kind of got your own life within a life. And, you know, the thing with, you know, some of the, some of the Chicago land schools, even when I first graduated and I went, 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 went out to Aurora University, but that was still far enough to to be gone, but close enough to be home. And then when I got to UIC, you know, I mean, I, we was, 20 minutes from home, you know, in the south suburbs. But, you know, it would be times if we needed to, like 
go home, you know, Friday night, Saturday morning, be back Saturday night, you know, but um, yeah, you yeah. have to understand that the homesickness is real and and you have to really be committed because, you know, are certain things deal breakers, you know, and I and, and, and I think that, you know, that a lot of kids um, don't understand those things. You know, they looking at, OK, well, I want to go to this school. I want to go play with these players. Maybe want to go play with these coaches. You know, but what's a deal breaker and what's not, you know, is having your jersey on the name on the back of your jersey a, a, a deal breaker. You know, for some it is, um, you know, is is playing in a in a system where like the school and the coaches know you and care about you. You know, is, is that better than going someplace else? And I know that y'all deal with that, you know, because the you know classroom sizes are you know, pretty normal. So it's not like going sitting in a lecture hall with seven, eight thousand people, you know, and and, and yeah. people really not knowing you personally. You know, so like are those yeah. type of things deal breakers? And I think that people really have to to understand, you know, that business side that this is a you know a, a business, but you need to decide and be comfortable with that decision that you make because things as little as as homesickness does catch up with you, you know, so, you know, you go to UIC, you're rocking and rolling, you finish, you know, playing basketball, UIC, now you're a student assistant. And I want to say this to anybody watching this, if you don't know, all right, Tracy Dildy is probably one of the top three re basketball recruiters ever, all right, and, and, and he you know, again, going to be modest, but people that understand, and I'm going to let him talk about some of those guys, but Tracy Dildy had star after star after star after star, and he willed them to, you know, want to play at home and, you know, be great teams, not just individuals. Tracy Dildy put together teams of, like, superstars, and so he's one of the, you know, one of the best recruiters, I would say, personally but you know you started out at UIC you know and people may not know you know people the likes of Kenny Williams whose name is hanging in the rafter you know Sherelle Ford um you know all of those guys you know Jesse Henderson I mean the list goes on and on and you were able to do it again with DePaul University you know getting those guys to stay home Quentin Richardson and Lance and Paul Paul McPherson all of those guys you know, I ain't going to ask you to give away your trade secrets. You know, I understand that. But do you think that they sense a sense of comfort and trust in you above anything? Right? And, 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 as you would know, the one thing about it, it's, it's all about, especially recruit, it's all about relationships. Right. And once people got to understand, people got to, they got to be able to trust you. They can't let you. You ain't just saying and telling what they want to hear, but telling them what they need to hear and telling mm -hmm. them that you do support them and you got their back. And, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, I was blessed, man. When you talk about it's three jerseys retired on the men's side of the UIC. Of uh, Kenny Williams, Shreel Ford, and Mark Miller. Well, guess right. what? I, you had a I recruited all three of those guys. <laughs> right, right, you know, so right. I was, forced, but I, I was able to recruit all three of them guys. And all right. three... Uh, Gerges retired. Right. Terrell Ford, uh, NBA draft pick. Right. When we talk about when he went, uh, he was the first ever first rounder at UIC drafted. So, you know, you, you talk about, and then I was able to, uh, you know, it was recognized that I was pretty good. And I was able to go on the ball state. And then I recruited a guy by the name of Bonsby Wells. Right. I forgot about that. The Bonsby Wells. Who played years in the NBA, and then after you know spending time at Ball State, was able to move on and come back home to DePaul. And like you said, yeah, man, when you talk about, I was able to recreate what DePaul had done before. Right. When they had the Mark Aguirre, the Teddy Grubbs, the yeah. Skip Dillers, the Bernard yeah. Randolph, the Roger. Yeah. Top of the Chicago homegrown, and it was just right. a great time that year, man. And we was able to get Quinn Richardson. Bobby Simmons, Lance Williams, mm. Steve Hunter, Paul McPherson, Andre Amari Sawyer. Mm. You know, it, it, 
it's the, all the top guys right. uh, in the Chicago areas that year. And we were beating out Duke. We were beating out Arizona. We were beating out Kentucky. Because yeah. See, people don't realize when Richardson visits was Kansas and Kentucky. Oh. In him. You know, okay. You know I'm saying? Bobby Simmons was Georgetown, Arizona, Syracuse. Mm. We ended up getting him. Lance Williams, Missouri, uh, UNLV, all of it. And so then you're talking about Amari. And so you're talking about on that, when, when you talk about the McDonald Americans win, and I tell a story that um, people, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm humble and I'm not prideful. But let me tell you, a kid we actually turned away. Came out. I don't even know if I told you the story. He turned Dwayne Wade away. Coming out of Richards. Dwayne Wade came out the same year as Amari and Andre. Mm -hmm. Right. Now remember, Andre was all Americans. Right. Dwayne Wade wasn't all American. Right, exactly. The other side of that, Andre Brown was a qualifier. Mm. And Dwayne Wade wasn't a qualifier. Wasn't. Right, exactly. We only had two. with Amari and Andre. Well, now you see, you know, Dwayne Wade goes off and, you know, he sits out the year Marquette, you know, end up having a great career, took them to the heights and, and doing an NBA. But I tell that story because that's a true story. Mm. We played at the fall. Yeah. And but we went with Amari. And I don't regret going with those two guys at all because those two guys were great at the time when you talking about ranking because that was big at that time. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was clearly the highest two rank. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, we was fortunate. And then, you know, you know, being able to coach the talent and it shows that we did some right because we still have – I still have great relationships. Paul McPherson mm -hmm. and, and – are playing in the big three. Right. Right. Uh, Mark, Bobby Sanders came to Chicago State. He was the one that bought fly. Yep. Lance was the one that get a sound. All our former players have always came to me at other universities. Right. So it's so, it says that I of my word yeah yeah no no and that's big you know because i mean really at the end of the day even in life that's that's all that we have is our word and you know it's it's it's, it's funny about the Dwayne wade you know story yeah. because you know i mean when you think about it but but you have to understand you know you know what you have as opposed you know you you think and you know jerry wainwright got you know he told me a couple things that has stuck with me. But one of the things that he said, he said, potential can get you fired. You know, it can be a good thing, but yeah, yeah. potential can get you fired because you waiting and you waiting and you know you see something in, you know, that 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 kid, be it basketball or life, you know, you talking to him, you waiting on the engine to start up and for them to get it. But because people don't understand that basketball well, one is, you know, entertainment, you know, but it's also a business. So, you know, when you get on the level of, you know, college coaches, pro coaches, some high school jobs, you know, business is a little bit more magnified than if you any other place. And so if you're, you know, constantly trying and trying and trying and they just don't get it, you know, at some point in time, you 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 still have to tend to all of those that's you know being left in the midst, just sitting waiting. You know, it's almost like the good kids in class never get attention because the bad ones is always the ones that, that, that you know that, that's getting the attention. You know, so but you waiting on that potential of that kid. You know, but sometimes you know it's an old saying that says when the teacher is ready or, or, or when the student is is ready, the teacher will appear. And that's kind of how, how it's got to be. So when you look hindsight, like, you know, damn, you know, we could have had Dwayne Wade on that team, but who knows how everything would have gelled together. You know, you all had a, had a, had a great run at, 
you know, DePaul kind of brought it back to, you know, the, um, you know, the Papa Meyer um, days. And then, you know, so, you know, you wind up going to Auburn, Ole Miss, you kind of stay, um, you know, south for a minute, you know, and then you went to yeah. UIC. And I know me personally, I was, you know, coaching the high park at that time when you was at UAB, but, you know, then you, you, you kind of come back home. And I think this was probably one of your best recruits ever because he was such a sleeper when you was at UAB, you know, can you talk about um, Aaron? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I still got coaches that was, when I left at UAB, and they actually, I'm talking about saying, hey, man, thanks for, I was a young man from Hubbard High School. Right. Little bitty guy who, uh, I'm telling you, man, just, and, my recruiting with him, it came down to him and Pullum. I don't know if you remember the kid Pullum. Jacob. He's mm. Penn State. And so yeah. I had both of them, and both of them was, hey, we're going to take the first one said he coming. And Aaron was the first one said he was mm. Hey, man, the man ended up having such a great career. He can go back to Birmingham, Alabama. They retired. Uh, they gave him a key. He goes down as the all-time assist leader in history. And just, man, an uh, all-time fan. I'm talking about just all-time. Right. He, he, one, one, he one of the people that was the most favorite guy that wasn't from the state of Alabama. And so, man, mm -hmm. he really had a great career in all conference. And that was during the time when he in the conference. But he uh, ended up being player of the year, one right. year, with all right. conference. Right, and right. And during the same time, he was at Memphis. And so, man, Aaron, he, he, he still goes down to the One of the best point guards, when you're talking about just a true point that could lead a team. Yeah. Team and direct. He, he was just a natural coach. On, and, you know, he, he, he made a whole bunch of money playing overseas for himself. Man, and he can all the Birmingham the city is wide open to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember, man, when I was at you know when I was at Hyde Park, and um, you know it just used to be so hard to contain him, man, because you know he he was he was was an old head too. You know his 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 poise was was kind of yeah. Im immeasurable. You know what I'm saying? Even when he was in high school. You know, he didn't get rattled, you know, and no matter what Trey was, really, what, like five, six, maybe? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, but wouldn't get rattled. And that's with his shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, you know, wouldn't get rattled, man, just great athlete, you know, uh, very humble, you know, young, young, young man as well. You know, I think that was one of the best recruits there because he, he, he was kind of slept on. Um, you know, but then, you know, we know you go back to UIC and then, you know, you wind up getting a job at Chicago State. Now, this is what I want to talk about before I talk about anything at Chicago State. Um, you know, I had um, 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 Jamil on the show and he when we first started, he said my, my two, you know, college coaches, you know, we were both his college coach. You you spoke about. I want to say this one thing and then get to the question. You you spoke about Aaron being the first one to commit. And in life, we have to understand that when opportunities present themselves, we don't have all day to think about it, to, you know, pray about it. And, you know, to do, you know, we have to at some point have a little bit of discernment. And that's why I was saying, even with, you know, the people that you recruited, you know, that they feel that trust. We have to have a certain amount of discernment to understand if this opportunity is for me or not, because we, would you agree or not that so many people wait so long on opportunity it wind up passing them by? And, 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 and that happens so much more. And like you said, man, you had a word that I love is that word discernment. Right. And, and, oh, hey, this is because we get we get opportunities 
we got to know, you know, when the and and that's why if you basketball right now it's the crime. We got over seven hundred that have transferred from. Yeah, and this is all yeah, right decision. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason they it, it, it wasn't the right decision right. because you right. know, I mean seven hundred. We're talking about seven hundred. We're talking about all like almost two for every Division One university. Exactly, every university. You're talking about. Yeah. Oh, Open seven hundred transfers. Right, that's a, a lot of people um, choosing for the wrong reason or not knowing the best situation for them. Yep, exactly. And you know that's 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 why you know again, um, plug you know our sponsor, Bless the Ball Skill Development Academy. But that's why we even offer parent consultation classes because you know like parents parents may not understand like what happens. If a coach, you know, my kid signs and a coach, you know, gets fired or goes to another school, you know, what what happens, you know, when when this takes place, you know, what is expected of my kid? And as I said, you know, this book is great for parents, too, because it, it you know, goes not only in my mind, but also, you know, other head coaches and, and great people that I, you know, grew up that, you know, helped teach me. But like, you know, you have to understand that. It's a it's a business side, but you have to know kind of the expectations and the rules. So if a parent gets this book, now they won't they can have a better understanding about why some of the some of the choices, some of the things that coaches may make, and it's not just oh he picking on my son or he or she picking on my daughter or vice versa. You know, like you know how come they not playing and why are you treating the kid this way? You know, I'm pretty sure that you've dealt with I've dealt with it. What pains me more than anything is when you have a kid that you're trying to get straight or that you're trying to correct, and then you get met with so much opposition from the parent. But then, you know, sometime down the line, now that parent is calling you to be that kid's buffer because they can't control the kid. And, and, I, and that's why I say your book is a must read for parents first, Carville. But we still do it, will in life. And like I tell with parents, and I'm recruiting the kids we recruit, and whenever I, it's his choice, it's his I, a family decision because yeah, somewhere I know when my I'm not happy, and right. that's just is, and that's why I say, uh, man, they gotta. It's a must read for parents. Mm-hmm. It's a must read, and it'll help them help. They better decision when you talk about the whole recruiting and understanding the next level and the hard right. thought that's in it. So it's a must read for parents. Right, right. And I, you know, I definitely, definitely appreciate you saying that. And, you know, so wrapping up, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I got a couple more questions. Then I want to give you what we call the three hot seat questions. But now you at Chicago okay. State. Um, you know, you take the school to its first postseason, maybe I'm not sure if it was ever or I know in a long time. And then you got moved to the WAC. Um, but the thing that stands out to me and, you know, you and I talked about it. I think we might have been in Dallas that year. We was going to the you know, I always go to the, you know, the head coaches meeting. And so we kind of rolled together that day. But you you were number one in the country coach for APR percentage. Can you explain what APR is to the people that don't understand and why that speaks volume being number one in the country and like kind of where y'all came from? Sean kind of talked about it, but I want to know your standpoint and why being number one in the country with that APR, you know, why that meant so much based on where the school was when you first came in. Well, and that's what, and actually because I don't know when we first, our first job in like May, where in like June, I'm down in Indianapolis meeting with the NCAA. The NCAA had got fed up with Chicago State and its <laughs> academic performance. And, and so we walked, 
they just really, man, wasn't what we were doing at the men's basketball program. What well, they they had graduated one best eight years, and so realized my first two years. Remember, we couldn't even right, dollars, and our practice time was limited. The NBA right. at that point was talking about basically shutting down our division once because our academic was, and so the first thing we did when we came in, we want and right. Right now, you know, I, I, I got an eighty percent graduation rate, which is extremely high, and we have success rate. And so the academic, which the NCA is not playing, you got students they got to come in, they got to graduate. Right. And so right. Form is rate score. I'm in school history. Um, that's not many schools that you hear. Got other than the Ivy League schools, got a perfect thousand. Right. And so right. that was golden now that we shot to stay around in that same area. Uh, and, and I first thing, and not only uh, graduate them, but make sure they have a great, because the happier you are, the better. And simple form. Right. Like, yeah, man, that our first years, we were. Penalized things that there. and so we have really cleaned that up. We, we you know, we got out where you know, always right, right now, right, mess with that thousand score, and so you know, that's a serious. We didn't serious. We didn't do it because of any of that. that was the thing? And there to great. Best right. part, kick him out. Right, and that was it just instilled it in me by the coaches I played for. Right, and worked for us. So yeah, man, we we did year three, which is the first year we can go to post season. We actually won a conference tournament. Right, and went to postseason. I realized Carville was in the last. We're the only Division One team in the state of Illinois to win a conference tournament. Exactly. The only, only Division One team to win a conference tournament within the last five years, and people don't uh, understand or realize that. And so that's a big first time in postseason was just to get back to postseason, but to get to that. Right. Um, yeah, and so, you know, like, people don't understand – that's why they made the word what it is, student athlete. You know, and my dad used to always tell me, you show me a smart a student, I show you a smart athlete. You show yeah. me a dumb student, I will show you a dumb athlete because sooner or later it's gonna show up. You know, it's it's almost like it's gonna show Teddy, up. yeah, you know, it, you know, like the Teddy Pendergrass song, you can't have him himself. At some point or you know, at the time. It's gonna reveal itself, and unfortunately for us, sometimes it reveals itself in a moment in which we don't need it to re reveal itself. <laughs> you, you know, uh, but you know, so I don't, I don't want to, you know, get so much into, um, you know, things that you know you look for, things that you, you know, like. I don't want, you know, to deal with nothing, you know, that 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 you might not be able to answer because if you know the the open period is is over. You know, but I, I I know that, you know, you love Chicago State. You know, I know that you all are constantly improving. And but if, if, if anything else, you know, the the academics, you know, I think speaks for itself, you know, on a beautiful campus. Um, you know, I actually graduated from Chicago State. You know, I, it, 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 it took me 10 years to finish my undergrad. I tell people, you know, when I stopped playing basketball kind of UIC, I was kind of going part time, wasn't really caring about it, wind up going back and finishing. But it took me 10 years to get a four year degree, you know, kind of like what Eric Thomas say. But it took me one and a half years to get my master's degree. And I wind up going back 10 years after I graduated. So I'm not ashamed to say that. Hey, I, 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 I finished. I did what I was supposed to do. You know, but Chicago State has a wonderful, beautiful campus, um, you know, um, that's that's very. um 
what's the word I'm looking for? Very like intimate, you know, you don't have to really worry about, um, you know, being just, in, you know, a small fish in a, in, in a huge pond. So, but I do know that the coaches at Chicago State sincerely care and put in a whole lot of work um, to get their players better. Now, I said it, he didn't say it, I can say it regardless. But now, I want to ask you these three questions, Coach, on the uh, hot seat. Well, first of all, my last question. You, you, you are in the UIC Hall of Fame, you're in the State of Illinois Hall of Fame, and you're in the Chicago Public Schools Hall of Fame. Um, uh-huh. Do you still sit in all sometimes? I, I, I tell you, I, I do that. You know, so I, I tell you, man, that, that I try to. I wear my faith on my sleeve, and I, and God has blessed me. God has shown me favor, and He continue to show me favor. He continue to bless me, and, and and I know what the rule is. I'm here just to serve. Right. And by right. Being an example of a guy from my neighborhood that you know could hey be inducted in the UIC Hall of Fame, be inducted right. into the. Chicago Public League Hall of Fame to be inducted into the state of Illinois fan. That's a testimony. Because when you come from where I came from, no, that's all testimony. And so it, it, it wasn't for my glory, it's for God's glory. And so exactly. I'm just thankful, I'm humble, and I'm just appreciative that he chose me to use and to be a testimony in those areas. Okay, yeah, and that's that's, you know, we have to Never forget where we come from, I think, you know, is the biggest thing. Um, and, you know, even with life, neighborhoods, basketball, whatever, you know, never, never forget the, the history because then you can kind of know where you're trying to go from there. But so now these three quick hot seat questions, Coach, nothing that's, okay. com- you know, confrontational, nothing like that, I, okay. I don't believe. But my so the first question that I have is who is the best player you've ever played against? Ever. The best. I've ever played against Isaiah Thomas. Mm. Best player I've ever played against. Now you talking about high school? You talking because in the period. summer league? No, period. Him, it was, he, he's a clearly best player I've ever played against. Now why? Huh, because he was my height, and just was, was amazing the things he could do. How he could actually, from his size and his position, dominate a game, and that's kind of what he did. It's just so happy he did it playing against me. So but I didn't feel bad. I saw him do it. I saw him do it in his whole NBA career. So I didn't feel too bad. Okay. 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 Uh that's a that's a good one. You know, I, I think that people don't really understand what the 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 things that Isaiah did um at even at his height. Um and you know, from what my dad say, you know, my dad grew up with his brothers, his brothers was better than him. And and yeah, yeah. I, I I hear those stories, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, so you know, I even you know remember him telling the story on Oprah how you know they used to have to sleep on ironing boards, and you know he kept his basketball with him. You know he had that that goal and that that drive to understand. You know, and I tell players, you know, always always you know if when I do drills, I always say like like this is my basketball and I will take care of it because I'm pretty sure that you've probably told me. And you told other people we all heard it like that little orange thing will take care of you if you take care yeah. of it. You know, I, I yeah. mean, yeah. it'll yeah. take you places that you've never been. Even if you know, once the yeah. ball stops bouncing, there's many ways to stay around the game. And if you be true to the game, you kind of said it earlier. You know what I'm saying? If you do the work, if you be true to it, that that little orange round ball will will can can definitely change your life. Yeah. Um. Now, the second question, it got so two more questions, Coach, and we've done. I appreciate your time, but I know that you're a busy man. Um, who is the best player that you never got? Like, who is the best player that you wanted? You know, I know you talked about Dwayne Wade, but is anybody other than him the best player that you ever wanted and you never got? Well, that would have to be um, Corey McGinn. See, Corey McGinn came out that same class. with Right. McGinn. And that was okay. improvement. And he ended up going to uh, Duke. But Corey McGetty was – imagine we would have had Corey McGetty with that group, man. And, and so right. Corey goes down as probably the best other than Dwayne Wade that we didn't get. Okay. Okay. Um, 
And I think that people actually, you you know, you know, uh, forget about Corey Maggette, but he had a great NBA run too. Last question, Coach. Um, what would you like to see change about Chicago basketball as it is now? And that's on any level. What would you like to see in terms of Chicago basketball? What would you like to see improve? I would like to see uh, – I, I would really like to see it get back into the high schools where um, we're able to actually go to the high schools and watch them play in the summertime. So I would like to see it more, you know, high school oriented all year round. Like one of the best things, the best tournaments ever used to be the Morris Shootout. Right. That used to be the best event of the summer. And you had all the kids playing with their high school team. So I would really like for the uh, ISHA to loosen up the restrictions and let the high school coaches coach these kids in the summertime. Because as, as you said, what Coach Cox did with y'all, and it kind of goes back to, you yeah. know, the whole book concept. He he was with y'all, so he held you up to those standards, held you up, you know, made you accountable, but kept up with you, was able to literally put his hand on you and kind of self-direct you and the things that he knew that you needed, not that you wanted, but that you yeah. needed during that point. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So I wish, man, that – SHA will loosen up their rules and restrictions and let the high school coaches be more involved with their students in the summertime. Right, right. Because that is where the development happens. We know basketball players have been remade over the offseason, and that's, you know, during the yeah. summer. And so, yeah. you know, not only physically, but again, mentally, um, you know, and as both life and basketball, if you have more adult supervision, and people don't have to worry about running around, you know, sneaking or think they cheating or doing this or that. You know, if 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 we really doing this for kids, you know, then we really have to give them the most available resources that is is offered. You know, and it's a lot of people that are out here that are willing to do things again. That's that's why I wanted, you know, to do. Uh, change it up with season two. The first season was just really, you know, reading chapters of my book. But this season, I wanted to kind of, as I said, bring people together so people can kind of know about certain individuals. Maybe they've heard of them, know that they are like real people. They, you know, they, you know, they, they, they don't hide or think that they better. But for me to give some recognition to what they're doing, because if we're really about the kids and about the betterment of our neighborhoods or society, I think every, you know, it's a lot of separate individuals that want to start it. But if we don't learn how to, you know, co co collaborate and work with one another, nothing to ever get done because now you got a, a million individuals talking about that they want to help, but they don't understand if you put all, all those million together, you can conquer so much more space and people, you know, with less time. And so that's what I'm trying to do with this show, um, you know, to get it out. But again, Coach, I definitely appreciate your time. Um, you know, anybody, please, you know, go out again, share this uh, mm -hmm. Facebook live, but go check out um, Chicago State. They always have a great year. Coach, what what day do you all start? I know you can talk about that. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, we actually starting. We've been practicing because, you know, the NCAA allow you every four years to take the team on a summer tour. OK. And four years ago, we came to Costa Rica. Well, we okay. leave in Thursday morning taking the team over to the Bahamas to go play three games. So we have actually really started. But we won't start the season until November 11th. Okay. But okay. we've been through the summer tour, which our guys are excited. We've been able to work with them over the summer. And we leave Thursday morning to go to the Nassau Bahamas and to play three games over there. And so we'll be over there five days. And so our guys will get a chance to have some fun, play some nice. basketball. And then just enjoy, you know, some good weather and some good, you know, beach and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely great team building experience also, man. Well, good luck to you guys, Coach. Um, you know, that you guys have a, you know, you know I know you always, you know, y'all past couple of years been kind of right there, you know, in the conference tournament. But, you know, I know that you brought in some good talent. You've got some talent. 
coming back. And, and I think these guys are experienced because for the most part, you have a lot of guys that's been with you for a couple of years, so they kind of know the yeah. system. Um, you know, so definitely go out, go see a Chicago State game. Very inexpensive. Uh, you know, you will be entertained. And, you know, come yeah. out. You know, I mean, the thing with, you know, with Coach, you know, you're going to see him. He's not afraid to, you know, correct. But it's, you know, correction through education, even during the games. You know, not really worried about who's in the stands. I'm here to correct you and teach you again life based on what you just did on the basketball court, you know. So, you know, I'll be watching, Coach, you know, and, you know, you'll, okay. you'll, you'll look up sometime, catch me, you know. I don't, you know, necessarily always have to be seen, but, you know, definitely support you and your staff and what you try to do. You, you know, taking a few of my players, I definitely appreciate that for helping yep. them to change their lives, man. And any last words that you want to say, Coach, you know what I'm saying, before we get out of here? Man, I just want to, again, thank you for this opportunity, man. You're doing amazing things. Keep touching lives. Keep, man, spreading the love, man. Keep sharing that world of knowledge that you got, man. And like we say, man, it takes a village, man. And, you know, and we're going to have to do it together if we want any success, man. But I really appreciate, man. I pray for you, brother. I love you, man. And I pray God continue to show you favor and cover you and your family, man, in Jesus' name. Well, I, Coach, I definitely appreciate it. Amen. Definitely appreciate it. Um, there you have it, guys. Again, another short educational class. You know, you learn about some, you know, Chicago history. You know, you learn about some basketball things, and then you learn about life as well. You know, that's what we come to do with this show. And again, being sponsored by Bless the Ball Skill Development Academy, you know, you can, you can, I will drop the link that you can reach us on our website. Again, I dropped the link. Um, it, it, it's in the links for the book, Understanding Life Through the Game of Basketball, uh, an effective uh, guide to coaching and leadership. Uh, great book. Go pick it up. Support me. Uh, support, you know, the thing that I'm trying to do. If nothing more, just, just, you know, they say readers are leaders, you know, so, you know, grab a good book. Uh, I can vouch for it. You know, it, it, it will definitely help you and help those in which you put this in their hands. As you all know, Bless the Ball is also a character um, development after school program. We also do during school programs as well. If you know a principal, all right, even you, Trey, if you know a principal, if you know an administrator, you know, tell them to reach out to me, especially with CPS. We have our vendors number, you know, I know the budgets, they're always talking about that. But if we really want to improve these kids and you know i do have jamil working with me coach like you know he he said it was all like he 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 fell in love with the game all over again you know so if you know an administrator or a principal even in the suburbs you know let them know because we have a program that is is, is well suited and helpful to those individuals you know we've had um great numbers with um our disciplinary referrals going down with the attendance of those individuals in our program going up as well as the grades going up. So, you know, we understand that the teachers need to teach, but the kids need to also learn about life. And so that's what we do, but never more. I like to thank you, Coach Dildy. I like to thank you for, you know, giving me the time again, go support Chicago state, check out Chicago state um, coach. You know, I know that you got to get home home because you either got to, FaceTime the grandkids, call the grandkids, see the grandkids. Some, you know, I see you on pictures all the time now, double breasted. You know, I'm like, man, he loving this whole grandparent thing, man. And I think that um, that just shows also, you know, the growth in you uh, with understanding balance, too. You know, you deal with your team, but you do give that time back to your family. So I definitely appreciate you, man. All right, my brother. Love you, man. God bless. Yes, sir. And, and partner, as I always say, you should be reaching for the top because it's crowded as hell in the bottom, at the bottom. So with that being said, peace. We'll holler at y'all a little bit later on Thursday. Thursday, I got another great guest coming on. Join us back here Thursday night. All right. Peace out. Thanks, Coach. See you. All right. Thanks. Talk to you. All right.